Hello. 
so good to see all you actual humans. Um, if you missed that little pre-announcement, um, we all may now not remember this, but you should turn off your ringers when you come into a theater. So please do. Thank you. Um, tonight's speaker is actually one of the speakers that uh, we've worked with in a way more than any other. He's worked with us on, on many interval talks. And so it's great to have him here on this stage. And, and this was, you know, there's, sometimes there's those books that come out and every single person you meet says you have to read this book. Um, it's so relevant to what you do. And, and, of, and of course, Ministry for the Future was exactly one of these kind of books. And so we knew that we had to have uh, Stan back for this. And um, it was in a conversation I was having with Ramez Nam, who's going to actually be doing our uh, question and answer, who's also a previous speaker here, um, who wrote the Nexus series and is now doing investment in clean tech. I realized there could be no better perfect person to do the Q&A afterwards. So I'm so glad that both of them were able to come um, and to make this talk and that all of you are actually here making this talk. Um, and I think that the, one of the, the really interesting things that came out of Ministry for the Future was I think how many other organizations have been asking Stan to kind of work with them around this concept from that book. And one of them was the UK delegation with the COP26 summit. And so tonight he wrote a special talk really out of you know, what he's learned from both of these experiences and where he thinks things are going right now. And afterwards, uh, Mez and Stan will have a conversation on stage. And please feel, feel, feel free to fill out your question cards. There'll be someone going around to get them. Thank you. It's Kim Stanley Robinson. Well, thanks very much for that kind introduction, and uh, appreci much appreciated. It's good to be back, and it is good to, unexpected joy to see people gathering together like this again. Uh, may, it, may it all come back. It's sweet. Uh, um, I, I want to, before I begin, I want to dedicate this talk to Michael McGilligut. Um Many of you knew him better than I did. And, uh, the last time I saw him, he was curating a talk I gave over at the interval on Ursula K. Le Guin. That was his idea, his invitation, and it's amongst the favorite amongst my own talks, close to the top, in the top five, a beautiful evening all around. So tonight, I'm going to talk about the ministry for the future and COP26 and what I have learned six, since COP26 is it's um, a fire hose of information, as we all know. And now a lot of it's getting aimed my way by a kind of a category error, because I am an English major and a science fiction writer. And um, that's all I am. So <laughs> the shift from, if somebody is actually coming to me to find solutions for climate change, then we're in terrible trouble. <laughs> um, and it's worried me a lot. Um, but I'm beginning to see uh, things that I can do even as the cardboard cutout for the minister for the future. And um, that's been a bit of a comfort. And I'll tell you about that journey. Uh, for those of you who have read the book, it won't need explaining. But I want to, for those of you who haven't, it's um, the idea came from me, came to me when I was thinking um, about this new information that at wet bulb 35 temperatures, human beings will die of hyperthermia, that we aren't evolved for it and uh, it will be fatal. Even if you were naked in the shade with a fan on you, hyperthermia would still kill you within hours. We just aren't set for it. And there had been a, a movement, um, eco-modernism, or maybe just your ordinary environmental humanities departments or philosophy departments just saying, humans are so adaptable, we'll just adapt to whatever temperature happens, although of course we should try to mitigate, but since we're not gonna do it, we'll just be ever so adaptable. And this was of course ignoring all of our cousin species we rely on, but it was also wrong in that vast swaths of the Earth's surface, including one of the highest wet bulb temperatures ever was outside of Chicago. Um, so vast parts of the Earth's surface could become uninhabitable and suddenly the 1.5 C uh, limit on temperature rise that had been advised and got uh, taken up as one of the achievements of the Glasgow uh, COP26, was beginning to look like 
a necessary hard limit that we need to adhere to. One of several planetary boundaries that we are plunging towards a, in a trajectory that seems to say we're going to be going past them into a, uh, toward a hothouse Earth status, which in the paleological past would mean almost no ice on the planet at all, etc. In which case, we'd be seriously underwater here. Um, I needed to write that, and that's why the first scene of the novel is in India in one of these heat wave events, and it's a shocking experience, I know. It was hard to write, it's hard to read. And then after that, a best case scenario. Um, with that kind of a situation that we're in in the 2020s, I wanted to portray 30 years going in, in, into um, a utopian space with utopia defined as this. We dodge the mass extinction event because everything else is recoverable. So the bar is quite lowered compared to the perfect society of old. But um, it would be a mighty achievement if we were to indeed to dodge a mass extinction event in the 21st century, given where we are and where we're going. So um, this was the goal in my novel. I wanted it to look and feel messy so that when you were reading it, you could suspend your disbelief in classic Coleridgean style. You could, um, um, this, the willing suspension of disbelief is the, uh, the joy of every reader of novels' lives. And I began as a reader before as a writer, that's for sure. You read it, you believe it, and then you come out it afterwards and you evaluate it. So to believe a positive future from where we are now, I had to include a lot of the bad stuff too. And I notice now looking back at it, a lot of things I didn't notice while I was writing it, which I have to say was about um, six to eight months in 2019, a much darker time than now, I have to add, because it wasn't clear that uh, Trump would not win. And also the pandemic hadn't happened yet. And so it looked like we were going to slouch mindlessly sleepwalk off the cliff. Um, and in many ways, the pandemic was a slap in the face that speeded everything up for both uh, ill and for good. So in 2019, I was in a darker space. And so the dark stuff in Ministry for the Future is quite dark indeed. And I wouldn't want to have anybody take this book to be an instruction manual as to how to behave, uh, given the various murders and shooting planes out of the sky that occur in the course of that particular history. Looking at it later, I saw that for every time something positive happened, there would be a reversal. There were three kinds of death, and there's murder, illness, and accident um, to major characters. There's um, a sense that um, of, of uh, desperate chaos that nobody's in control. That, um, and everything, in other words, that is inevitably going to be the case in the 2020s, I wanted to represent in that way and yet still show a sequence of events that would get us to a point like 30 years out, although now I would say the timeline is completely wrong and that everything that I talked about happening in 30 years needs to happen and will happen in about 10 years, which is a shocking acceleration, but I think it's true. So I had, you know, a, a novel about heat death, heat, heat, heat wave deaths of millions of people and then how to techno... Um, you know, political economy, finance. It really sounds quite awful. I mean, doesn't it? As a novel reader, it's like castor oil. It's Already I had a reputation for being the castor oil of science fiction literature. You know, it's good for you, but you, you're you going to have to choke, uh, hold your nose as you, as you down this stuff. Um, a novel needs to be fun. And so, like in New York 2140, perhaps they're having a little bit too much fun in a world with sea level rise 50 feet higher. That was a different time and a different kind of a novel, a comedy of coping. I quite love that book. It is more fun. But Ministry for the Future had to have its own fun. And that could be in the play of forms. So it hangs on a regular novel that's maybe novella length, um, Mary Murphy and Frank May the two central characters, and then their shadow, Badim. These, for a long novel, uh, the ordinary characters in it are just quite few. But onto that, I also hung uh, everything, Wikipedia articles, meeting notes. And I had dramatized enough meetings that when I discovered you could just include the notes, this is a marvelous discovery. <laughs> uh, nobody had to go through another meeting in a room, uh, which in Green Earth is a... Um, 
a long slog through the DC uh, wilderness. Um, also, it narratives. This was something from the 18th century. It was a little fad when printing and reading came out in England. The it narrative would be the story of a coin. It would go from pocket to pocket or a violin. And being the 18th century, it would usually go through somebody's digestive tract and get shitted out. And it was all very exciting, except for uh, protagonists without agency. There's a reason the it narrative died very quickly. And um, I discovered that in writing just a couple for this book, a carbon atom, the market, that kind of thing, a photon. Um, also riddles, Anglo-Saxon literature, uh, about one third of what remains of Anglo-Saxon is, is riddles. And mostly these look to be puns. It's quite funny, the scholars can't tell one riddle from Anglo-Saxon, the answer is either a, an angel or a grasshopper. And, and usually they're double entendres of a sexual nature also. Um, so you can see that the games that were being played around the, the fire in the, in the barrow houses of the Anglo-Saxon times, I use those. Many other forms, dialogues, radio, radio transcripts, and then the eyewitness account. This was the crucial thing. It's one of the things that made this book's impact, in my opinion. It sure did for me as a writer. An eyewitness account is not the same as ordinary novelization. You don't talk, you don't set the scene, you don't talk about eating breakfast, you don't live it. They call it dramatization for a very good reason, as if in your mind you're seeing it staged in real time with all of its details, like drama. Well, an eyewitness account, they're usually interviewing someone 10 to 20 years later, that person is talking about what happened in a propulsive rush of memory and they're judging it, judging themselves and why, that, why they're being interviewed, what that did in history and what it did to their lives. These, as a modality, the eyewitness account is an awesome thing. And I began to collect collections of them. Um, spring 1945 in Germany, uh, May 1968 in, in Paris. These collections are uh, stunning. And some of them, the ancient world, the whole of history. Usually the bigger the stretch of the history being eyewitness accounted, the the weaker the anthology, but they're all worth looking at. And I might never write anything else again, but a whole bunch of fictionalized eyewitness accounts because it was like uh, channeling voices in a way that a novelist always wants, but seldom gets. Uh, sit down, be prepped, take a refugee camp or a riot at a train station or or a fishing boat being taken over by pirates from other pirates, uh, a city running out of water, um, like Cape Town, maybe. Um, and these uh, should have been and were five pages or less, and the book is stuffed with them. And that, I think, the sense of world history and multiplicity, the, the, it, it felt right and, and is probably the, one of the keys to the book, along with uh, the carbon coin, which I'll get to later, and the, um, the sense of chaos and disorder that the, all the forms together do. And there's one more thing that I did that I didn't realize till afterwards. I would divide science fiction up temporally. There's um, far future science fiction, which we would call space opera. People are zipping around the galaxy, Star Wars, tar Star Trek, space opera. People know what it is, but it's a form of fantasy as I tried to show in my novel Aurora, but it's a great story space. There's no, no knock against space opera, not when Ian Banks and Gene Wolfe have written it, um, Ken McLeod, there's great space opera. It's not normally what I do. In fact, I think I've only tried it once or twice, but it's out there. And, and a lot of people, when they, you say science fiction, they're thinking just that. But there's also near future science fiction. And those of you, sometimes you'll see Neil Stevenson do it, William Gibson, Day After Tomorrow. It's very common in science fiction that the present is, is presented as a few years push down the line with some classic SF extrapolation of trends to show what seems interesting in now. It's a form of realism to write now and reads as such. It's better realism than literary fiction is, with, without a doubt. And that's a, a big part of why science fiction has an impact in the world. Then there's the middle zone, relatively depopulate. Um, what I call it future history, a century out, two centuries out, three centuries out. If you think about it, you're not gonna find too many science fiction classics that fit that song. But if you think about my career, the Mars Trilogy, uh, New York 2140, that's the year. 
2312, that's the year. Um, uh, it goes on like that, uh, although I'm forgetting my own bibliography right now, but um, that is a zone I find of interest called future history, where you actually see not just what will happen with the present pushed, but what kind of historical change is possible from where we are right now? And can you articulate it on the page in a way that the reader can say, oh my gosh, in 2312, I could be living on the moons of Jupiter and um, visiting Earth, it would be a wreck. And they'd be fighting sea level rise and they never would have gotten out of their, their poor old poverty trap. Sad old Earth, I think I called it. And, and this is 300 years out and you can say, well, yeah, I mean, it could happen. No laws of physics are broken. It's not space opera. There's a history that runs back to now. Super interesting thing. Well, in Ministry for the Future, without planning it, what I think I did by accident was to take future history where history really has happened and I jammed it into the near future science fiction moment. So stuff that I used to write about happening 200 years from now, I said, look, it's happening in the year 2035, or it's starting right now, and we'll immediately. And this, I think, was like putting together, you know, like, let's see what happens when we put together some uranium with a little explosive force, and boom, it blew up in my face, and, and I've been blown up ever since. So I think this is what happened there. So... Um, it got, me, it got me invited to COP26, one of many rather astonishing invitations over the last year and a half. I was feeling surprised and then more surprised. And then after a while, I thought, either I'm not surprised anymore or else I'm permanently surprised, which is a great state of consciousness to be in. And we all should be wandering around going, I just can't believe it. This is, a, <laughs> this, this is amazing, because it is. And for me, it has gone from pillar to post and an invitation from, actually, I will tell this story on myself. I was at um, Glasgow inside the Blue Zone. My hangout was the UN Futures Lab when they were my home base, my, my buddies. They took care of me. They gave me a closet to sleep in if I had to take a nap and they taught me things. Well, there, and it was a tremendous education. And at one point, my, my main host, a, a woman named Coco Warner, who's worked at every one of the cops for the UN, she said, Stan, who invited you here? And I thought it was her. And I was looking at her going, oh my God, I don't know anything. I don't even know why I'm here. Uh, and I had to investigate, I had to pretend. I looked at her and I said, um, well, the invocation came from Nigel Topping, whose official title was the high champion for COP26, because the British government likes their titles a lot. The high champion was his official title, good guy, and he was the one who invited me. And he gave me a red pass, which meant that in the blue zone, I could go anywhere I wanted. And this wasn't true for most people who were observers. You would get a yellow badge and you wouldn't go into the negotiating sessions. That was for people with red or blue, and blue was just the UN itself. So there I was with this red badge, which Nigel Topping had given me. And I decided that the rest of the thing being a kind of a trade show for each nation would buy a pavilion in a giant convention center. And I, I don't know if you all have seen pictures of the blue zone in a cop, but it's somewhat like a trade show or a circus or a, um, um, it's, or a science fiction convention. And anybody who knows science fiction conventions, uh, one of those for two days is not bad for two weeks. You have got to be kidding me. Um, and yet, so I began to go to negotiating sessions, any kind of negotiating session. And this is very interesting. There were more than 50% women in their 30s and 40s, lawyers, diplomats, scientists. They were working a document. They were editing together. They were revising, editing, um, proposing. In th it, this is one kind of session anyway, document editing um, by a, a ferociously concentrated, cheerful but meticulous um, uh, from my point of view, young women, and with some elderly Brit diplomats who were staggering around with a limp and a briefcase from Bretton Woods. And it was, it was very cute how uh, calm they were compared to uh, uh, everybody else there. Um, and I was impressed by that. And then in other negotiating sessions, in, in very polite tones of voice, people were arguing over money. 
and the developed world was holding back their bags of money and the developing world was saying, you promised it and we need it. And in polite voices, you were seeing the incredible tight-fistedness, the self-destructive tight-fistedness of all of the developed countries who had promised money in the Paris Agreement and aren't coughing it up. One of the developing nations diplomats said to me, the, the sewage budget for New York City is $35 billion a year, and the developed world has just given us $20 billion when they promised $100 billion, and even $100 billion is... Uh, not enough, but 20 billion is ridiculous, and that's where they were at. So this was a depressing part of Glasgow for sure, but to see it all happen real time, I began to understand COP is just a place to come and look at each other on an annual basis to see what we're doing in the rest of the world the rest of the year. It is not the place of solving problems. It's, there's no legally binding treaties there, and there's no sheriff nor a jail if you were to break the promises or even to leave the agreement outright. Um, it has some beautiful mechanisms in it. It has an injunction to permanently improve each time they meet. Everybody is supposed to up their promises and make things better. And so it's like a ratchet or a come along. <laughs> each year you ratchet up the um, intensity of the promises, but they're promises only. And I began to think, it's like a marriage. This is what you got to think of it as. You promised to spend your whole life together and to do productive things together. Five years later, you break up. Nobody throws you in jail, um, hopefully. And, and so what you got at this point is a world in which all the nation states have, in effect, joined into a, a, a group marriage or, a, or something like a marriage, a set of promises to behave in certain ways together. And there's no place to move if you get a divorce. It's like one of those stories from my, my, my Soviet agent during the USSR days. He and his wife had divorced 10 years before, but they were still in the same apartment. Well, the world's going to be like that. We can't get away from each other. And there's, we got, I'm going to come back to talking about the nation state system. So I'm, everybody, I guess the last things I would say about COP, well, there's a, a few observations. It was a militarized site, so the UK government was really worried because of world leaders coming or because of Seattle 1999. Um, it was behind barbed wire and tank stoppers. The, it was on the River Clyde so that there were Zodiacs out on the river with um, military people and machine guns. There were helicopters just hovering oftentimes, especially during the marches. And the Scottish people were loving their marches. Um, I stood next to Bill McKibben as the start of one march. We were like at the parade marshals, you know, oh, off you go, off you go. And they were seeing McKibben, who's very recognizable, going, oh, my God, you know, it's uh, St. Bill is blessing this march. And they had taken their kids out of school, out of preschool. It was a family affair. Everybody had made banners and posters. It's quite beautiful. Um, 10,000 people on Friday, 100,000 people on Saturday, and about 100 people in a, in a non-sanctioned march where there were many more police than there were marchers. And I joined all three of them. Um, but the, I have to admit that the big one on Saturday, I only joined them because I needed to cross the street. And there was no other way. And so I went out there and I joined a group of nurses and we chatted for a while and I flowed downstream for about 100 yards or so and then got off on the other side and went my way. Um, but it was quite beautiful to see the civic engagement of the Scottish people with uh, being the hosts of COP. And then the results from it were good as far as they go. But every diplomat and scientist there, the more they knew about the COP system in the world, the more scared they were. Because although it is an admirable system and way better than nothing at all, it's too slow because it's built on a consensus model. Every nation there has to agree to every sentence. You saw an example of this in the last hours where they were going to phase out coal. And at the last moment, China and India and several other nations said, um, um, oh, gosh, we can't do that. Um, we, we, we refuse. And they went into a huddle and, over time, a couple hours of intense lobbying, and they came out, well, we'll phase down coal. And then everybody signed off on it. Well, this kind of consensus model, although admirable, it's like the General Assembly without the Security Council. So it's a true uh, international body of nations where you've got, I want to talk about this a bit more later also, from the nation state to the member state, a very important distinction. Um, 
you've got all the people there, but since they have to all agree to every statement, um, as admirable as it is, it's too slow compared to the crisis. I, w I reckoned on the train ride down to London that if we had, this is such a guess, but it's a science fiction exercise. If we had 40 years, the cop procedures might work, but we only have 10. So they're not enough. And, we're, and, and, we, and I left COP thinking we are in terrible trouble. And nothing in the four months since then has made me change my mind on that. We are in terrible trouble. But that doesn't mean, what that means also needs to be unpacked. So um, in the months since then, I thought it would slack off. It didn't slack off. And I began to get quite nervous about being helpless to suggest or say anything. But what I began to realize is I could take somebody um, uh, who were, was interested in talking to me about topic X, and I could connect them up with somebody else who was an expert on topic X. And they didn't know about each other because the world is too big. And that's interesting in and of itself, that although there's lots of good work being done, not only is there no coordinating force that's making priorities and, and linking things up together and all that, but that's almost impossible in the, in the world that we're in. Who would do that? I'm involved with the UN's 50-year forecasting group, and the UN is doing their damnedest to maybe rate and prioritize. They're overwhelmed. They can't do it. You would have to postulate a, a, a ministry for the future that was a really good budget uh, and, uh, and a huge team of people trying to sort and connect and that doesn't really exist, but as my cardboard cutout imitation of a minister, I can now begin to connect people who should know about each other. Just recently, I met the woman who runs California's 30 by 30 program. 30% 30 of California protected land for wild creatures by the year 2030. Amazing idea, and I thought it would never happen in my lifetime. And already they're shooting for 2030, and, and they say, well, after we hit 30 by 30, we're gonna shoot for 50 by 50, and then we'll have a healthy biosphere. And California is an exemplary space, as you know, and teaches the rest of the world how to do these things. And the rest of the world teaches California. It's a super promising thing. But she had never met the head of the Pacific Conservation League, which without this 30 by 30 framework had nevertheless been working on similar causes for the last 25 years. And I was able to say, oh gosh, you need, you know, you're both in the Sacramento area, I need to meet. They've since met, it's a productive meeting, things will go on. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me. And when I was talking with this Jennifer Norris, head of 30 by 30, what we began to discover together is you need the framework tail, the frame tail, because everybody's individual efforts are going to be too small to matter or to change the world. And you do what you can and you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm swimming again, I'm crossing the, Pacific by swimming, I'm in terrible trouble here uh, because it's such a small drop in the bucket or drop in the ocean. But if you see that you're part of a larger story where everybody else is also putting, say another analogy, a brick in the wall. You work on your brick, you know there's a wall, you'll stick your brick into it. This is a crucial realization for keeping spirits up. Solidarity, mutual aid, and it's funny when you think about this wall analogy. For one thing, I build my walls in Maine out of glacial cobble. It's the worst possible rock to make walls out of. Hilariously bad. And every, every spring I go out there with my wife and find my last year's wall has fallen down just from the freeze and thaw cycle um, and gravity. Um, and that's the kind of material we have, right? And also, there's no architect and there's no stonemason. But nevertheless, this is how um, group projects work, um, everybody knows what needs to be built, and so you just put your brick in the wall and you feel that the concept of the wall is helping. So I think that that's another reason why Ministry for the Future has had, people had a hunger for that story, that if everything that is possible to be done gets done, then even the bad stuff won't be able to stop us from getting to a good place. Now this is a proposition, not a Obviously, it's a, it's a science fiction story, a utopian one. When I say that, uh, I don't know if it's true and nobody else knows either. Um, I'm gonna come to a close uh, soon, but I wanna talk about a few things before I do. The accelerated timeline, everything's going faster, partly because of the pandemic, partly because no one person can do the research to figure out where the cutting edge is on all these things. 
So I was talking about a carbon coin, and I thought this was the idea of one guy, Delton Chen. In fact, the Network for Greening the Financial System is an organization of 89 central banks, exactly the people you want working on it, and they are working on it. Um, the glacier geoengineering, which I thought had been an idea slipped to me by a single glaciologist, it's got really good uh, papers on it in science and now in science direct, in nature in science direct. Um, there are new geoengineering methods that are less intrusive and more active than, uh, more uh, effective than solar radiation management that are being talked about all the time. And 30 by 30, as I mentioned, when I read the E.O. Wilson book, Half Earth, I thought, well, this is utopian science fiction indeed. This will never happen. And now we're already on the way to it. And that was only 15 years ago. So in this excel we're in a moment of accelerated danger. And there's also an accelerated response. So you can't freak out. I say this to myself. Um, <laughs> One time, I want to tell you about freakouts. I was in the Swiss Alps. I had crossed a pass. I sat down on a point looking down at a, at a reservoir down below me, and I saw a helicopter coming up. There was a little hut underneath me. It was closed. It was locked. It had no signs on it. And um, uh, it was irrelevant. And I thought that this helicopter rising up through the air was going to land at a Swiss Alpine hut I could see in the distance and resupply it, which I'd seen before. And it came up and it was facing me. And I was looking at the operator and thinking, why? Why is he here? It was really loud. And I was looking right through the bubble at the pilot. And he tilted in towards me. And I, be I got up. I turned around. I went on to the flat behind where I had been sitting. And he was, I, he was coming at me. He was coming at me. At, he was going to kill me. I was in a horror movie. I freaked out. I turned around and I ran up the hill like a bunny, like you see bunnies run when they know that they're doomed. I just turned and I ran. And I turned around again thinking, oh, God, this is so bad. And he, was, he needed to land on that spot where I was sitting. And he had no way to tell me that. I said, ah, yes, I, I'm not in a horror movie after all. You know? And I walked down the hillside to talk to him about it. And I said, geez, I'm sorry about, you know, sitting on your landing spot. I just didn't know. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, doom, really loud. And I realized that helicopter blades, as they're slowing down, they become visible from the inside out. And what I thought was the end of the helicopter blade was about halfway out. And there was a blur that I hadn't quite noticed. And I, and, and I was coming downhill and the rotors were, uh, were drooping as they slowed down, I was literally 15 feet away from having uh, decapitated myself. So I, I just gave up on talking to the guy. I, took a, <laughs> I went for the, the... The Swiss Alpine huts have a thing called Café Fertig, coffee finished, which is coffee filled with brandy. And I was going to go get a Café Fertig and finish myself up. And I had a, the sandwich that I'd been eating when this whole adventure started was just squished in my hand. To, it was a rib of dough, rib dough. I was eating this dough thinking, dang, I, how could have I explained to Lisa that I had died in a helicopter accident by walking into the blades? Um, but I bring up this story because we are going to be having freakouts like that. What? You know, Russia suddenly invades the Ukraine, um, and it's a disaster, especially for the Ukrainians. And for the rest of the world, you get this IPCC report, the one that really is the most frightening yet, as they all are. It's news. It should be the top news in everybody's feed every day for the next forever. And it's buried by a war, and we don't know what's going to happen next. And these kind of freakouts are going to keep happening as we go on. And even the war is a... Um, is a result of a country that is a petrostate. All the petrostates are in terrible trouble because they um, get 60 to 80% of their national income from selling fossil fuels, which supposedly is a stranded asset and should go away since they signed the Paris Agreement and you don't want to cook the planet. Well, they're on the horns of a dilemma with no way out. They're looking down the barrel of a gun. Save your country from complete bankruptcy and social collapse, become a failed state or else keep burning it and torch down the world and we're all in the same bo boat. Uh, some petro states are going to choose one and some the other, but we need, and people are right now talking about exit ramps for Putin, we need exit ramps for the petro states because it's about a third of the world's population that lives in petro states and they have no 
way to not be bankrupt. So the carbon coin is a great idea. You draw down uh, a ton of CO2 and you get paid a carbon coin and it's worth more in fiat currency. This is not a cryptocurrency. It's a fiat currency backed by the central banks. And um, you get paid more, you make more by drawing down carbon than it costs you to do that operation. And you get paid for doing the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Carbon coin is, I think the central banks are already uh, discussing it. It's a, it, it could happen. It, it's carbon quantitative easing. It's sometimes called the real obvious idea. But compensating the petro states, and here's where I'm going to end. We're going to have to do it or else we have a failed states all over the world and the world uh, falls into disorder. And they go ahead and drag their heels and burn their fossil fuels in a desperate attempt to stay solvent financially. This has to be addressed. Where are our economists? Where are our uh, political economists in this world? We need that worked out. I would say this, the payments, you got to go to the petro states and say, look, we'll pay you to keep it in the ground. The payments have to be amortized. So we'll, you'll get payments over the next century, just like as if you were selling the oil or coal or natural gas. It will be discounted. Wall Street puts it this way, you got to take a haircut. You won't get the full value, but you'll get enough that you'll take the deal. You get it discounted. And the discount rate would be real interesting. Should it maybe be a bathtub curve? You get a lot of payments, then you don't. Then you get more later as a reward. I mean, here's where the economists and people who like to do gamification of human um, uh, motivation uh, need to get into that game and work the discount rates. And then it has to be entailed. The money can't be given to kleptocrats and autocrats and just banked away somewhere else. It needs to be spent on decarbonization. And that is an imposition on national sovereignty. So there'll be squawks on all sides for this deal. The petro states will say, look, we are a nation state. We have sovereignty. If you're going to give us money, great, but we get to do with it what we want because you, you don't get to impose on us. At that point, the people offering to give the money are going to have to say, no, that isn't how this one works. And there you go from the nation state to the member state. And member states have a different relationship to sovereignty, legally and emotionally, than, than nation states used to. So the Westphalian system has to shift, and maybe finance can drive it, into member states. And all the European nations are now member states of the European Union. All the nations on earth are members of the Paris Agreement. So in effect, we are already supposedly member states. But of course, the big bad boys on the planet, the, the giant powers like the United States and China, and now Russia, they don't want to think of themselves as member states that are beholden to anybody else. Sovereignty still rules. But the petro states might be desperate enough to decide, we are now going to sign the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, or there's going to be a mechanism that's part of COP, part of the Paris Agreement, where the, the compensatory mechanisms for judging how much fossil fuel they have and how much they get paid get worked out in a big international agreement. And what I saw at COP26 shows me that will be enormously difficult, but it's better than crashing human civilization. So um, that maybe that's a good ending point, Maz. <laughs> better than crashing civilization, we pay off the petro states. Uh, we compensate them. We try to keep the whole thing going in a collaborative manner. We become member states of a larger unity, and, and we scrape through without the mass extinction event, hopefully. Yeah, all in there. <laughs> I better. <laughs> Aha. Stan, that was just fantastic. And always, always a pleasure to, to see you and to, to okay. get the chance to chat with you. Um, Stan, I just want to say before we start, I mean, you, you talk about yourself as, oh, I'm an, I'm an English major, I write science fiction and so on. But I think what you really are, in addition to a fantastic writer, is you're a philosopher. Like in your sci-fi, you are philosophizing about the future and how we, how we build that future in a way that uh, sci-fi that is sh smaller in scope doesn't really do. So, Well, I, I appreciate what you are uh, suggesting by that, but I want to, I'm a science fiction patriot. I want to say that this is simply what science fiction should always be doing. So that's the way I would put it, is uh, this is what science fiction can do. <laughs> 
Related to that, one of the things that I think is most interesting about you as a science fiction author and also as a climate activist is you see a lot of, uh, is a lot of climate activism that is very sort of naturalist and is opposed to uh, more aggressive and ambitious interventions. And in, in your books, in, in Ministry for the Future, but also in, in the Mars series, in the previous uh, Science in the Capital series, in, in 2312, you are very willing to go to uh, a real focus on solutions that are epic in scale, that are massive human endeavors. Where does that come from for you? It comes from Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we are a technological species. We were technological before we were human. We co-evolved with tools, fire, stones, et cetera. So, um, and maybe this is also part of being a science fiction writer. I believe in technology, um, but also justice is a technology. Language is a technology. It's a big word. It's what we do. And now we're in a, a desperate straits. So I've been thinking all hands on deck. Really, we ought to keep nuclear plants going as a bridge technology to cleaner, cleaner. Maybe we might have to do some modifications that people call geoengineering. We need to talk about that a little more because there's so many variants going on. But, uh, and I, you know me, I mean, many of you do, uh, old hippie leftist, an American green, an eco-Marxist American leftist, although e Marxist is really the wrong word, and, and eco-leftist, uh, the wobblies over parties, uh, you know my angle. And from that angle, I say tech, um, anything, whatever works, except for fascism, which wouldn't work anyway. But, um, but all of the things that we might try, we have to try, see what works, and, and dodge the mass extinction event, and then solve the outstanding problems. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Well said. Um, Stan, on the topic of technology that works and geoengineering, a couple different people in the audience, Sarah Schubert uh, and Paul Baumgart, hi Paul, uh, have asked about what are these geoengineering technologies you see as effective but maybe less intrusive than solar radiation management? Okay, well, thanks. I'm, and I only know this be, because of the last couple of months, running into Sir David King, um, the, uh, the Brit who was environmental minister to Blair and Brown, Sir Dave is working on this at Cambridge University, and I'm hearing things I've never heard before. You remember iron filings dropped in the ocean to create algal blooms that die and sink to the bottom. And the oceans are already so sick. Everybody thinks of that idea with a shudder of horror. And Sir Dave said, yeah, of course. It, it shouldn't be iron filings. It should be whale poop. I'm thinking, what? And he goes, well, there's only 1% of the whales that there used to be. They eat low. They poop high. This is Sir Dave in a British accent saying this exact stuff to me. It's a biopump. It helps everything. You have more fish. You have healthier oceans. It, 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 uh, it begins to even um, reduce the acidity. It's like the perfect solution. We're going to send ships all around the oceans, and we're going to have an artificially mixed, like giant oil tankers full of artificially mixed whale poop. Jump it, drop it overboard in a way that a whale pod would, and it'll even bring whales back, and then they can do it themselves. Well, I'd never heard of that before. I'm thinking, well, what's the harm in it? Like, what will it hurt? Um, another one they said, and this one maybe is more well-known. The Arctic ice is melting. The sea ice, the, the less and less. We're terrible trouble up there in the Arctic, worse than anywhere else. Uh, a lot of boats, and he said automatic boats like this new Mayflyer, but I think they could be crude. Why not? Be fun. Is shooting a very fine spray of salt water so that there are salt crystals in it just above the cloud layer, and it whitens and thickens the clouds, and you have a better situation in the Arctic. And it's not particularly like solar radiation management's global monstrous thing. And then the thing that's in my book, the pulling the ice out from under the big glaciers in Antarctica to slow them down, that could be done. Oil industry, navies of the world, uh, my next column in Bloomberg Green will be precisely about this plan. And you think, well, that's so crazy. No one will ever do it. But people do like sea level. They like the beaches. They like their coastal towns. And the fact that we could maybe, we have 10 to 20 years to, to stop the, the irrevocable massive rise of sea level such that we would be um, really and truly, this room would be underwater all right up to the ceiling in certain scenarios, pretty damn fast. So that 
these kind of these are the things. These are the kind of and there are more of them, of course. I mean, on the flip side, I did hear that you could buy land at Nevada prices that'll one day be beachfront value. Yeah. But it would be such crappy beaches compared to our beloved sand beaches. <laughs> this is why in New York 2140 and I think in Aurora, people are dredging old beach sand out of the shallows and reestablishing beaches on higher sea level because I want my beaches. Kevin Kelly asks, uh, are there other discoveries or inventions uh, outside of sort of the geoengineering space that you think are underrated or underappreciated today? Well, I... I'm behind the curve on this. Um, I, I, I stagger around. I, I would say Nature Briefing, Science News, Society for Environmental Journalists, and the American Geophysical Union's magazine, EOS. These four things can keep you scientifically literate uh, at a pace you can actually sustain. Just recently, I read about these deep water pumps. You just pump cold water from, it, ha, it works best in the tropics. If there's a 20 degree centigrade differential between the water deep down and the water on the surface, you can get about a two or 3% um, efficiency rating of electricity out of the hot cold water running a turbine. Um, they warned us that it, once you build 15,000 of these plants, you might actually change the temperature of the ocean in ways that made it work less well. I'm thinking, okay, we'll build 14,000 of them, whatever. <laughs> um, I thought that was rather exciting because these island nations that are already sinking, they have to ship in diesel at enormous expense. And if they had even one of these plants on their island, that island would be, have enough kilowattage to um, supply all their needs. And it's pretty clean. They actually, and you have little lobster in industries at the top of these cold pumps because it's cold water in the tropics, so they're growing lobsters. I mean, it's very funny. There is a comic uh, level to it, and I believe Stuart has always been very attuned to this. There's a comic aspect to our adjustment to the world technologically, and even though we're under ferocious pressure, and it all could go crash and boom, um, it still has a somewhat, to me, it's, it's like, well, maybe it's like Laurel and Hardy or one of these horrible Keystone Cops things. I mean, it's funny to see people in desperate danger. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Um, uh, you talk a lot about economics in the book. Like a lot of the book is really not just carbon coin, but other things. Yeah. One of the things you talk about, and uh, a listener called uh, Paul has asked a question related to this, is the discount rate and how that changes our calculus of investing to, to save the future. And I didn't hear you talk about it in this talk. Do you want to riff on that? Sure. I'll try to be brief, particularly since we're hitting the, uh, the borders of my comprehension. But, um, and a lot of you will know more than I do. The discount rate, when you're making an economic calculation about how much you should spend in the present to benefit the future, if, you, if they have the same, uh, and since the future goes out forever, if their um, needs are equal to ours, then our, we should be spending everything for the people of the future and not for ourselves. So a discount rate is introduced, and William Nordhaus won a pseudo-Nobel Prize for saying the discount rate could be 4%. Well, this is just a robbery of the generations of the future. It's way too high. And there are some people arguing it should be flat, um, some very good economists. Some argue it should maybe be curvaceous and start flat and then discount so you don't get infinities in your calculations. Other people argue the opposite. You could have a high discount rate, and as you run into the future, your calculations, you go to zero. Well, this is beyond me, but it certainly should be a big topic of conversation because the future gets Ponzi schemed when the discount rate is too high. And who would, who would make a decision on that, or how would that get determined, or how would that we affect the well, discount rates that okay, are used? But, well, this is a modeling exercise. Economists, so neoliberal economists would say, the, let the market do it, and um, we'll just let the group mind and the algorithms, the, the AIs, it, all this fear of super AI. I mean, Kevin is very reassuring about this in ways that are important to me. But if you give over the AI, over to AI, to algorithms, your financial calculations and modeling, you can indeed just dial it yourself and begin to tell um, business leaders and government leaders, and we should talk about private capital too. Uh -huh. um, the discount rate needs to be um, um, zero and then shading up to two uh, when you get to people that are 200 years out in order to make your calculations work. See what that does. They should be played with like a dial effectively. It's, a, it's an ethical dial, it's a moral dial. How much do you value? 
the lives to come after us. And uh, to be able to put a number on that is, of course, the great achievement of economics, if it is great. Let's stay on economics for a bit. So you mentioned AI, and this is the second novel after 2312, where you've posited that instead of using the market to determine a resource allocation, that uh, AI, I think it was quantum AI in 2312, and AI in this case, might be powerful enough to actually be able to do a rational and effective sort of economy optimization and resource allocation and not depend on markets as we have now. Yeah, I have no idea. Really. <laughs> this is where my English majorhood, um, I would refer you to uh, Francis Spufford's book, Red Plenty, where about the Soviet Union computer scientists trying to invent computers strong enough to run a centralized economy by planning alone without a market in time to avoid the crash of the Soviet Union. And you know the end of that story, but what a fine novel. And discussions of it online go into the technical aspects of this in ways I can't follow. Um, and also, it's still going to be coming back to humans, dialing it in. We will be writing the algorithms. The AIs will then be making the calculations. Like, how many shoes does the human race need? Well, 8 billion times 2. You know, it's not that hard. So uh, my feeling is it's still a, a human calculation, ultimately. Fair enough. Uh, you mentioned private capital. So I know that in the audience right now, we have a number of people who are uh, climate entrepreneurs uh, or uh, climate investors or somehow in the private sector related to climate energy. Raise your hands if you're, if you're one of those people out here. So we've got a number, I think, oh, I like that. I know. Yeah. Um, so what's your view? Like, you, you're this... In talking about sort of your, your interesting structure, you have this great passage where you're first person narrative of the market talking about yeah. like what it's done and how it's eaten everything. Um, what is your view of like the role of private enterprise, private capital, startups, and the market? I, I don't like the market. It's, a, <laughs> it's an over simple algorithm. It, we give our decisions over to it and say that they're crowdsourced, but in fact, it's predatory. Um, it, the algorithm is written in with too many externalities and it's not like two people going down to barter. I'll give you my ox if you give me a loaf of bread. That is not what a market is anymore. It's simply a, a, a systemic uh, extraction of value from, from working people. This is classic leftist theory and I'm totally in favor of government over market. That the, Essentially at this point, we're like in World War II when government seized the marketplace and private industries and said, look, to win this war, you're doing what we say. It's a planned economy, US, Britain. Keynes was a big theorist of this. And we won the war in a completely planned economy. Mm. Like, give us all your tin right now, that kind of thing. And yet, we're in a similarly existential crisis here where I do think governments have to take over. But however, we are in a global capitalist system. We've only got 10 years. And what I want theoretically, um, is not going to come to pass by um, a waving of the wand or by a thought exercise. We're in the world we're in. And what I'm observing is um, Chinese Central Bank has about $5 trillion in assets. Um, U.S. for EU about three. This is what they keep in the house in order to deal with crises. Private capital has, well, Mark Carney could gather um, $130 trillion in assets that all promise to be green. And what I'm saying is that the central banks have, have printed tons of money in the last couple of quantitative easings that capitalism being what it is in this late monopoly stage, the rich have seized it all. This because it's a kind of a vacuum is suck that the more money you have, the more you can grab out of a system like the one we're in. So all the QE money has not gone to the bottom 50% of the populace, but has gone to the top. There's tons of money and people are looking at weird things like maybe I'll buy some Bitcoin and then I can sell before it pops. That kind of uh, excess cash, lots of, and also lots of earnings of real businesses of things that people really wanted as well. And there's a lot of it and it's being aggregated into asset managers. So when I wrote New York 2140, it was hedge fund managers. They were after their alpha. They were simply playing the game in order to make lots of money for investors that could afford to be, take risks. And if they lost it, it didn't matter because it was just a pocket change to them. So you would try, your alpha was how much more percent you got per year than the ordinary rate of, of uh, having a savings account or whatever the average was. So that was an ugly game. Michael Lewis exposed that game often, the, the big short lawyer's poker. But now, 
it's different. I saw this in Glasgow. There was lots of private capital coming there going, how can we green the world fast enough to avoid catastrophe by investing? And maybe it isn't the highest rate of return, but it's the rightest rate of return. The, 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 they're going long on the world because when the world crashes, it's bad for business. <laughs> and so, what I, but there's so much capital that, and that there are asset managers now that are dealing with stupendous amounts. I mean, Larry Fink of BlackRock was at Glasgow. In fact, I ate his um, excess pizza. I sat down and I was starving. <laughs> I said, can I have this pizza? And my Chinese friend, head of the Chinese World Wildlife Fund said, you sure can, you're eating Larry Fink's leftovers. <laughs> I was starving. Um, so, but he stands for- There's a metaphor in that. Yeah, there is. <laughs> the, the science fiction writer is always starving. Um, but. I saw it over and over again. I, I was meeting with groups. Anybody who asked me to come talk, I would try to understand what their angle was and try to encourage them. It was just what I felt my role was. I had 38 engagements in 12 days, and I just talked my brains out. I actually lost my voice, and I had to talk anyway. Uh, very creaky voice by the end. Uh, I forged on, and what I saw were groups that wanted to go green. It was more important to go green than to max your alpha. And this, I think, is maybe a sign of being scared, but also of having the right values at last. So, um, you know, there'll be post-capitalism one day, but right now what we need is green capitalism and government intervention big time. And the two together are both crucially necessary. So a couple of directions go to that. Um, Robbie Nicholson, who's a climate entrepreneur trying to change banking, uh, asks, what's the most surprising impact that's come out of the ministry? Uh, or maybe what's the most surprising of these invitations that you got at COP? <laughs> There's a clear winner there. I'm off to do a conference with the Dalai Lama next month. Um, so I would say that one, I thought I was beyond surprise, but um, yeah, that one is the clear winner. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm a long now hometown guy. I mean, I love long now, but the Dalai Lama has been a big part of my mental life for, for um, decades. And he's 87 and he's, um, he's the great God. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. And, it's, and it's in his town, you know, or Dharamsala, the town that the Indian government that Nehru gave him to be in exile in, in the, in the Himalayan foothills, the rhododendrons will be out. And I know I shouldn't be uh, selfish about this, but, um, I never thought I'd see the Himalayas again, even from the foothills or the air. And now I'm going to just to do this one trip. That's amazing and yeah. well-deserved. Yeah. Um, one, more, one more finance question, we'll move on to other topics. Uh, Carol Block uh, writes, you know, we're looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And one maybe surprising thing that's happened as far as the, the opaqueness of the financial world is, is that the Swiss have dropped neutrality and are unmasking these Russian accounts. And so they will not be a clearinghouse uh, for private, uh, hidden uh, Russian wealth. Yeah. Uh, does that give you hope about a future of increased transparency that might help in this? Maybe. It is, a, um, it is the Swiss dealing with their dark past of being the bag man for the criminals of the world and becoming a wealthy little country that is just entirely 65% a vertical mountain range of great beauty but low utility and yet being extremely rich by being the bag man, these secret accounts. And of course, there's the Nazi gold, there's the Jewish gold. It is a dark past, and a lot of Swiss are really, um, they repress it, but they're not proud of it. So at this point, maybe they're trying to make a break and, and come clean at last. And now all money is digital. And it, it's, it occurs to me that although I don't believe in cryptocurrencies whatsoever, I don't see money has... It's a medium of exchange, it's a storage of value, and it's a sign of social trust. And cryptocurrencies have failed all three of these tests of money. So I'm a believer in fiat money. But, and the Swiss, are they've got a solid uh, part of that, and all money is now digital. I wonder if it could be trackable. You don't need blockchain. Blockchain is peculiar. It could be cryptography. It could be a different system. It might quickly be quantum. And then you would know where money was. You would know if it was legal or in a tax haven. I mean, this gets to be, I am talking about as a statist here. 
like anarchists or libertarians are going, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, we need to be able to hide our money. The state will be in control. Right now, I want the states in control. I swear to God, it's the only way we're going to solve climate change. That is not an anarchist project. That is a state project. But it needs to be member states, not sovereign states. So um, in that larger picture, money is important. You can't um, let money slip away into pockets where bad actors get to continue with it. At least that's my theory. You've got to kill tax havens. Actually, taxes are a stupendously interesting and powerful tool. Mm -hmm. For, for doing good things. Fantastic. Um, with the relationship with state actors and other actors, as you said, there's some dark passages in Ministry for the Future, and one of them is climate terrorism. Uh, Sarah Schubert asks, why do you think we haven't seen climate terrorism or violence directed at people that are perceived as, as climate criminals, and do you think there's something that will happen in the future that will actually change that? I don't mean to laugh because I'm thinking of the Fermi paradox, you know, like why haven't we heard from aliens? And this is now called the Lanchester paradox from John Lanchester, wonderful British writer, good on money, good novelist. And Lanchester's paradox is why aren't we seeing this stuff? Same question as Sarah's. I don't know. Um, McKibben has been steadfast in saying nothing works except for nonviolent resistance that um, gathers the support of the moderates in the middle and the ordinary citizen, when they see people um, in a disciplined way staying nonviolent and doing civil resistance, it garners their support. Whereas even one bomb going off or even Extinction Rebellion lying down and blocking people on their way, on their way to work on the freeway, you gain more enemies than you gain adherents. So um, this uh, rhetoric is the ancient Greek art of persuasion. And it's worth studying a rhetoric handbook because they had it wired. And it's a beautiful thing. It's one of the few things English majors study that is useful and fun. Um, but there is no good rhetoric of actions. Like, and this is a question of praxis. What do you do to change power into more healthy directions? And you have Andreas Malm, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. You got Erica Chenoweth, Why Civil Resistance Works. You have McKibben um, pointing to the effectiveness of a kind of Thoreauvian, almost a Christian, Martin Luther King, you know, uh, lay down in front of the tanks, take some harm, and everybody's on your side because it isn't fair. Um, I'm not competent to discuss this argument very well, and the Ministry for the Future is a mess. It is not a book you go to to sort these things out. It doesn't make a good distinction between sabotage and murder, for one thing. And Badim, the guy who's doing things in the black wing of the Ministry for the Future, you have to decide what Badim did in the story by judging what you would authorize if you were Badim. So I cleverly snuck away from many um, statements of responsibility on what my, I myself would support because I was too squeamish about it. I don't know. I, I'm, I myself am a, a pacifist, uh, and, you know, um, kind of Vietnam era pacifist. And so I would not want to recommend violence to any, other people that I wouldn't do myself. It strikes me as a very bad idea. And so I didn't, but ministry was also trying to be a realism. Bad things are going to come down. And if, if villages start being wiped out and your entire family is killed and before your eyes, those people are going to be angry, not just for justice, but for vengeance. And so we may begin to see more of it. God knows. I hope not. It would, uh, it would be better if the story of violence compels people to act right before the real violence comes into play. And that's one of the reasons I did what I did. Mm -hmm. Stan, I think something else we saw in the book is other sorts of unilateral actions. So looking in the book, uh, India takes it upon themselves to engage in solar radiation management, geoengineering. Yeah. Do you think we'll see nations, island nations, anybody, uh, engaging not only in solar radiation management, but in unilateral pro-climate sorts of activities? Well, we certainly would have no moral basis to object to it if they did. There isn't an international regime right now. They would not be breaking any laws. In, in my novel, someone objects to the Indian minister on the phone. I think my Mary Murphy, well, that breaks the Paris Agreement. Why did I write that? It, it's not written up in the Paris Agreement that you can't do um, solar radiation management. I, it, I, it was just an unforced error as far as I'm concerned. And I would revise it. I might even revise it going forward, but it almost doesn't matter. 
um, maybe it implies that there was a, a treaty passed, don't do this on your own. Um, international governance, people are working on that right now, very hard, a, a, a method of deciding if whether or not to do solar radiation management as being global and maybe messing with the monsoon. If India decided to do it because they were suffering, the rest of the world would just have to say, you know, um, okay, you did it. There was there would be no sanctions and there would be no moral right to sanction them. It, it is important to add to social radiation management, although we base it on Pinatubo and uh, sulfur dioxide, which would work. Sulfur dioxide uh, burns up the ozone layer and is bad in quantities. So you would need it to be limestone dust. And um, limestone dust is already up there. It has similar effect. It's inert and drops back down to the ground in the way that normal dust does. And there wouldn't be a termination shock. If you did it once, it would be like Pinatubo. For five years, it had lower temperatures. The dust would cover the ground. You could figure out whether you wanted to do it again as an emergency major if people were being cooked alive. So even geoengineering, uh, well, I think this is my role as a science fiction writer. Every, um, I mean, the man from Mars, everything should be on the table. Um, including things like this that uh, ordinary American liberal leftists would say, oh my God, you can't do that. But why? In yeah. 1990, there might have been a moral hazard. Now it's all hands on deck and it might be break glass for emergency usage, drop temperatures for five years, see what happens. I mean, I really think that's a possibility. I'm with you. Um, on that note, Stuart Brand had asked, what do you think of Neil Stevenson's termination shock? Oh, I, I, I haven't read it. Neil and I, we, we are, it's, this is maybe um, the doppelganger, the narcissism of small differences. We don't read each other. It would it'd be a freak out. <laughs> it would be a total freak out. Um, I, I very much like Neil personally. Um, and I've seen him um, entrance a table of NASA scientists with his... Um, his um, uh, spinning table takeoff device uh, and he's uh, what pages of him I've have read from Diamond Age or Cryptonomicon a few pages here or there just to see what he's like he's very funny I'm, I'm envious uh, it's hard to write comedy and he seems to be good at it but I don't know um, from what I've heard about Termination Shock it's like come on Neil we got a serious problem here <laughs> it's, it's not time to have um, eagles um, killing robots in the sky over Texas or whatever the hell. Um, but I haven't read it, so presumably it's a... <laughs> Stuart, Stuart does say we should box it uh, with ministry. Yeah, so, box okay. it. Yeah, get yeah. the yin and the yang or the yeah. kneel and the stand. I mean, you have to notice this. The, his Baroque cycle is the same time as my Galileo's dream. His Seven Eves is the same time as my Aurora. Um, and now Termination Shock and Ministry for the Future. He has good judgment in terms of stories. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, just a time check. What is our end time, Xander? Wrapping it up. So let's, let's ask a couple of questions about sci-fi itself about, and writing. So Kevin asks, uh, what would you write differently now? Any of your books you'd go back and change? Oh, well, a couple I would, I would disappear entirely. <laughs> All the zap the zap and but everything since um, that that goes back into my youth, I must say, and I and my youthful self would be extremely irritated with me for being so condescending. Um, um, probably those are masterpieces that I can't recognize anymore. <laughs> um, but everything since the Gold Coast, I would stand, I would stand by, and that's 1988. So what the hell? I there are. I was very intensely frustrated by Pacific Edge where I didn't manage to tell the history of how they got to their utopia and that brought the Mars trilogy into existence. I was very frustrated with what I now call Green Earth, that trilogy in Washington, D.C., Science in the Capital. What a gnarly beast of a place is the Washington, D.C. bureaucracy. Never set a novel there. Um, you could see that in the novel, I busted out into Rock Creek Park and went feral on purpose to try to make the novel work better, but that was a frustration to me. Um, I'm, in, a couple, in a couple cases, um, initial conditions, you know, fundamental choices you make at the beginning of the novel, you can be a really good craftsman and technicians of novels, and you're still working on a crap idea to begin with. And uh, so that's where I feel the stress and strain. But some people just love Pacific Edge. Some, it's Cory Doctorow's favorite novel of mine. Um, and so you've got to 
not be too ungenerous to your past self. And I'd just leave it all the same. Awesome. Um, so actually, uh, we were talking before this started. I think we saw each other in London in like 2014. Yeah. And you said, you, it was Shaman had just come out. And you said, I've got one or two more books in me. You've had four novels come out since then. I think you've got 21 or 22 novels out, some number of short story collections and so on. Uh, are we going to look forward to more books from you, uh, please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would want to say this. My editor, Tim Holman at Orbit Books, he gave me my 60s. And artists don't usually have a well-platformed and encouraged 60s. It's a time of disarray and retreat. Um, one artist in 10 has a, a, a well-supported 60s because artistic lifetimes are shorter than biological lifetimes and people want the new. So um, I was feeling that and it was partly because of that damn DC novel. But Tim Holman said, no, 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 um, uh, try, uh, I'll, I'll just buy three novels from you. We'll figure out what they are later. And, and, and boom, uh, I did that twice with him. And I just love this guy because he gave me my 60s. He said six novels in 10 years, and I like all six of those novels very much. Um, because of that sense of, of security, whilst I knew what I was doing and my kids were growing up, I could just work every day. And I worked every day for 10 years. Now I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm done. Um, but I'm not done done. I'm just going <laughs> to give ministry a chance to cook for a while. And one thing I want to try, and you'll see whether it comes true or not, but I think I can do it. I want to write short novels. I want them to be 125 pages long and, and do the deed. Because there are some short novels that knock your socks off. But how did they do that? I'm, I'm a little mystified. Uh, but I want to learn that. I'm gonna, so yes, I'm going to write more. They're going to be shorter. And uh, I need to have some ideas, but I've got some ideas. So yeah. Awesome. Last question, I promise. Uh, what gives you the most hope for the future? Oh, God. Well, <laughs> um, uh, well, the memory of my mom gives me the most hope because she was a hopeful person, and she did it by willpower. It was partly biochemical, but it was partly a moral attitude. You hope, first of all, because you're alive, and hunger is a kind of a hope, and bacteria have hope. Hope is um, subtle but omnipresent. So then political hope, it's, it's Gramsci. Uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. You will it as a way to go forward. And, you know, you do it for the future generations. You do it for the people in the world who are immiserated right now. And, like, if we don't have hope, how come they have hope? And so it's almost a moral imperative. So that's what gives me hope is that hope itself is intensely... Uh, tenacious and um, it will we're going to have to suffer some amazing uh, defeats reversals confusions violences it's going to be an unholy mess the 2020s i guess i'll end with this is it weird the the are the 2020s really a critical decade in all human history and earth on life on earth history that strikes me as suspicious the, the principle of mediocrity would say, we're not that special. There's something going on here. We're just worried or, or we're self-important. But then when you look at everything, you're thinking, well, you don't want a sixth, uh, sixth great mass extinction in Earth's history. That would be big. That would be hard on us. Um, maybe this is an important decade. So you have to be hopeful in order to squeak through this important decade. The will to hope. Yeah. It's awesome. a willed experience. Fantastic. I like that better than the will to power. So everybody, Stan Robinson. All right. Thank you. Thank you.